but not too late. I think we'll, we'll, we'll get underway right, right now. And so thank okay. you very much everyone for, for making this session. We, we apologize for um, the late start um, and we would like to go right ahead. I can see that we have a couple of attendees in the room already. Thank you very much for coming um, this morning, this afternoon, wherever you may find yourself. Um, we're very happy to have you in this session, which is um, titled uh, Collaborative Biomedical Innovation in Africa to Eliminate Infectious Diseases. It's hosted by the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, DNDI. Now, as you'd all know, innovation in biomedical research is critical and has been growing quickly across the African continent. Um, never a time like now has innovation, biomedical innovation been so critical to providing solutions by way of drugs, by way of vaccines and diagnostics to address infectious diseases, particularly those that affect the poorest of the poor um, across the continent of Africa, uh, which we have known as neglected tropical diseases. Over the past um, two decades plus, there has been a lot of collaboration towards these biomedical in innovations, collaborations uh, towards funding, collaborations towards the research that would deliver these drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics. And today, uh, we're going to hear from panelists, seasoned panelists who are involved on, on, on both sides of the aisle, if I can call it that, from the funding through uh, to the actual conduct of the research and how uh, the funders work among themselves together with researchers, our researchers across the globe, particularly those focused on work in Africa, within Africa, Africa-focused, Africa-led research, how they do this work and, and, and the successes we have to date and uh, the vision that we have moving forward into the future to provide solutions. And this morning, I'd like to introduce some of our panelists really quickly. And because of time, I'll have to do this really fast. Dr. Monique Wasuna is the director of the DNDI Africa Regional Office. Long time experience with um, infectious diseases, particularly neglected tropical diseases, trained as a medical doctor. And um, Dr. Hayato uh, Urabe is the senior director of investment strategy and management at the Get Fund. Uh, again, a funder that um, focuses on a number of um, infectious diseases um, including the neglected tropical diseases and has provided significant funding, uh, GHIT, uh, to, to, to work across the African continent. Um, he'll be speaking to us on some of their strategies and um, the, the work that they're doing. Dr. Janet Burianga um, is a medical doctor uh, who uh, currently works with the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD, as a senior program officer in public health, and she's responsible for coordinating and facilitating the development and implementation of policies on health and medical products. And Dr. Alfred Mubangizi is an assistant commissioner for health services, Vector Bond, and NTDs at the Ministry of Health um, in Uganda. Um, but I will hold on uh, for now because I'll be introducing him properly very shortly. And finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Matthew Jiroge who is a scientist at the H3D, the Drug Discovery and Development um, Center at the University of Cape Town. He's involved at the cutting edge of um, advancing preclinical drug discovery projects. And he will also be speaking to us about uh, some of his work. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, you're welcome to this session on collaborative biomedical innovations in Africa. I'd like to uh, inform you of our hashtags, hashtag WHS Africa 2021, hashtag World Health Summit. And do please make use of the interactive sections in your Zoom box at the bottom of your screen. Use the Q&A functions in Zoom to provide your feedback and also ask any questions um, that you may have um, to us. I'm gonna go right away into the session uh, this morning, and I would like to introduce um, Dr. Alfred Mubangizi from the Ministry of Health uh, in Uganda. He's, as I mentioned, the Assistant Commissioner for Health Services, Vector Bond and NTDs, a division of the Ministry of Health headquarters. 
and he's a national coordinator for the NTD programs. He coordinates all NTD implementing partners in Uganda, and he holds a master's in public health from Makerere, the famous MAC in Kampala, which he obtained in 2009. Also obtained his earlier degrees from Abara University of Science and Technology. Um, he also has uh, skills and training in planning and management um, from the Uganda Management Institute. He has attended several courses and really is experienced in the management of NTDs, uh, particularly also in the WASH section. He has spearheaded uh, the work in Uganda to date and has really been involved in um, moving the NTD roadmap uh, 2030 from the perspective of the uh, Ministry of Health in Uganda. And with this, I'd like to hand over the floor to Dr. Alfred Mubangizi. Thank you so much for being with us. We look forward to hearing from you, Dr. Alfred. Thank you very much, Dr. John. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, I'm Dr. Alfred Mubangizi, as you have heard, Assistant Commissioner Victor Bonnick, the Tropical Diseases and National Coordinator for NTD. They are distinguished delegates. Ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. Welcome to Uganda. On behalf of Minister of Health and Minister, of, on my own behalf, I'm pleased to have you join us in the heart of Africa, continent of Africa, the part of Africa, as we work towards the common goal of achieving good health for everyone and everywhere. I take the honor and the privilege thank the organizers of this World Health Summit regional meeting in Africa, the Strength and Collaborative Biomedical Innovation in Africa, to eliminate infection disease for opportunities to participate in this important summit. Africa continues to suffer from neglected tropical diseases, also considered as a disease of poverty and equity. They affect the poor, poorest members of our society, causing disability, and the mortality and robbing the continent of human capital and billions of dollars in economic productivity. The World Health Organization kindly classified 20 diseases as neglected tropical diseases. This is the debilitating disease that, that are a mixture of parasitic and bacterial diseases are endemic in 49 countries in the continent and affect over 600 million individuals. Representing 42% of global burden of NTT, the epidemiology of NTD on the continent varies greatly, with many countries affected by as many as five or more of these diseases at any given time. Uganda is in the same category, with the high, high burden of neglected tropical disease. This is disease mainly affect rural communities, which is that in reduced productivity, hence affect the social economic development of this cooperation. Control and elimination of NTD is part of Uganda National Minimum Health Care Package, as heightened in health strategic, sector strategic and investment plan three. Yet the vision of Minister of Health is to have healthy and productive population that contribute to the social economic growth and national development. Health is a key priority in Africa. Sustainable health security for the African population requires cooperation and application of existing knowledge and innovation, as well as generation through robust research and innovation of new contexts and specific knowledge. Technologies, innovation, and expertise that can shape infidelity-based policy making and inform health interventions leading to improved health delivery awareness. This is in line with the WHO stipulated the guidelines on accelerating elimination of NDD through implementation of innovative and intensified disease management, in addition to other interventions like preventive chemotherapy, vector ecology manage and management, provision of clean water and sanitation, and the use of multi-sectorial approach. However, this can be achieved if the medicine produced by innovation in medical research are affordable, and accessible to meet African priority needs. This will help in achieving the goal of World Health Organization NTD Roadmap 2020-2030, which 
which include but not limited any epidemic of MDD by 2030, as if this by 90 reduction in the number of people requiring intervention against MDD by 2030. The elimination of MDD by either interruption of transmission at national or regional level, or elimination as a public health problem. These include African human trypanosomiasis, Gambiens or Kosakiasis, Leishmaniasis, rabies, soil transmitted hemisis, cystosomiasis, trachoma, and lymphatic flarias. Drugs for neglected tropic disease, drugs for neglected, drugs for neglected disease initiative. DNDI is one of the signatories of random declaration on NTD, which was signed in the 30th January 2020, where pharmaceutical companies, donors, endemic countries, and NGOs came together, signed a declaration on NTD. Together, they continue to control, eliminate, and educate at least 10 diseases by 2020 and improve the lives of our over 1 million, 1 billion people. And I thank BNDI for keeping their promises. Uganda has been a pioneer of efforts to develop and then accelerate the introduction of new medicines for infectious diseases. Over the years, Uganda institutions working with partners from across the region, like Drugs for Nectar Tropic Initiative, and other international partners have been successful in innovation efforts to introduce new treatment for viscerous maniaches, sleeping sickness, and other entities. In 2018, our robust our host Makere University and Uganda National Health Research Organization entered into five-year had ara SCC consortium together with other neighbors, together with our neighbor, Malawi, and the Drug for Negative Disease Initiative. This consortium is trying new medicine developed for sleeping sickness addressed form of the disease which proportionally affect Uganda and Malawi. The study will provide clinical data to assess the safety and efficacy of the treating both stages of sleeping sickness and be intended to contribute WHO control and elimination efforts in East Africa by providing evidence for potential new and the area administer, is it administer or drug? Uganda is a member of Africa KADIA consortium, which brings together 10 research and academic partners with funding from European and European countries, clinical trials partnership. The consortium is undertaking a large scale phase three clinical trial assess efficacy and safety of combination of metfesson and paramosacin in treating VL in East Africa. He's also looking at developing new diagnostic tools that are less invasive and less dangerous to VL patients, most of whom are children. Ladies and gentlemen, what we have learned in these remarkable experiences is that successful development and rollout of new tools requires partnership collaborative, open speech, and end-to-end -end approach. The question of access and affordability needs to be asked at every beginning of the discovery efforts. Development of new medicine tools is like a rare race, is like a rare race in which each runner must complete their leg, but also must make sure to pass on the battle. We in the government and those who support R&D efforts have responsibility to make sure that our policies do not obstruct the runners or make the race more difficult than necessary. We need to prioritize innovation for infectious disease in national plans, support open and collaborative R&D as well, and ensure there is sustainability, sustainable finance. I wish to, I wish a, a fruitful liberation during this workshop and continue success in delivering new tools address the priority health needs of those suffering from infectious diseases in Africa and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to declare this symposium officially open. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mubangizi, uh, for those um, opening uh, remarks. Uh, much appreciated. It's exciting to see 
the work that is going on in um, Uganda and how that really reflects the um, biomedical innovation that is taking place across the continent, supported by uh, many of the partners uh, whom uh, we, we hope to learn more about and from today. Uh, I think this is a unique opportunity in this session to really get a bird's eye view of the major activities that are happening across the continent and beyond in the area of both the funding and the research itself for infectious diseases, particularly neglected tropical diseases, be it drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics. Even those of us in the field sometimes have a tough time keeping up with all the new um, networks, organizations, entities, and activities. So really this is a one-stop shop where we hope to really catch up on a lot of what is going on. And with that, I want to begin um, the first part of this session, asking uh, you, Dr. Wasuna, as the director of the Africa office of the DNDI, if you could tell us some of the uh, current innovative platforms that are addressing NTDs in Africa, um, of which DNDI is a part, some of which DNDI is leading and is, is supporting. If you could just give us this, uh, you'll say in French, a coup day of what is going on across the continent. Dr. Wasim. Thank you very much, John, uh, for this introduction. Uh, I'll first of all start by telling you who we are. Uh, Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative uh, is a collaborative, not non-profit uh, drug research and development organization uh, that discovers, develops, and delivers treatments for neglected patients around the world. Um, DNDI was created in 2003 uh, by Medicine Sans Frontier um, MSF or Doctors Without Borders together with six other public institutions including our very own uh, Kenya Medical Research Institute. Uh, this was in response to the frustration of clinicians and the really desperation of uh, patients uh, faced with medicines that were ineffective, unavailable, not safe, unaffordable and had never really been uh, developed at all. Um, so as a way of introduction also on, on neglected tropical diseases, which for this session I'll call NTDs, uh, Alfred, uh, Dr. Alfred has already, you know, brilliantly um, uh, described them, but I just want to say two things, that about 40% of the global NTD burden is in the African continent. And um, therefore, innovation is required uh, because treatments that exist uh, for these NTDs are really uh, have a very low uh, cure rate. They're not easy to use, as I've said before, and there are safety concerns. And NTD um, really causes millions to be tra trapped in endless poverty and, and lead to death. So uh, when DNDI was created in 2003, um, a strategic decision was made to create a disease-specific disease uh, platforms to help in the innovation for treatments for visceral leishmaniasis that was occurring uh, uh, in Africa. Uh, so leishmaniasis is the Africa platform, uh, which I'll call LIB, abbreviated as LIB, and the human African trypanosomiasis or sleeping sickness um, platform, which I'll call HART. Uh, these were created in 2003 and 2005, uh, respectively. Um, so there is also a filaria platform, but I'm not going to this. For this presentation, I'll just uh, talk about the two platforms, that sleep and heart. So why was it, why did DNDI find it necessary to create uh, the leap platform and then also join other partners to create the heart platform? So these two are very important uh, regional disease specific platforms, um, leap and heart, where we are created so that, uh, you know, we could define needs and contribute to uh, the discussion on the target product profile. For those of you in clinical research, you know that you know your this TPP, uh, the target product profile. It's a discussion that you have to have well in advance before you even put your uh, drug into clinical trials. You want to know, for example, define the efficacy, the dose, the route of administration, and so on. But who best, who is best able to do this? is the wearer of the shoe. So that's why uh, the platforms were very key. And also uh, the platforms were key in to, you know, to strengthen local research capacities. 
which at the beginning was really fragmented. Some people having capacity and others really having um, challenges. Also the platforms were really to, um, to carry out or to conduct clinical trials, both preclinical, clinical and implementation studies. And you know, it was projected in the future to help with the, facilitate with the registration of the innovation. So uh, the LEAP platform therefore was, uh, as I said, was created in 2003 and the countries that were involved were Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, and Sudan. Um, and you've heard why they were created. And uh, you know, the, the, the LEAP platform had six clinical trial sites spread in, in those four countries. And their membership is about 60 uh, members uh, from 20 countries. Um, so, well before uh, the LEAP creation of the LEAP platform, um, the treatment for uh, uh, leishmaniasis, which I'll call uh, VL, visceral leishmaniasis, which I'll call for this presentation VL, uh, was an antimonial compound called SSG. And uh, it was the first line treatment given for 30 days. Um, so even in terms of uh, uh, clinical trials, some countries had never done clinical trials before. So the R&D capacity was really uh, fragmented. Um, diagnostic capacity was not there. Uh, data management was really uh, also um, poor for decades. And so there was no new treatment that had been uh, registered. So then comes the LEAP platform created by DNDI to be able to innovate and, 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 and Cut the long story short, <laughs> I wish I would had time, but we were able to innovate two new, treat two new treatment options for, for VL patients uh, in, uh, in the region, uh, using already existing um, drugs to make treatments shorter and safer and more effective. So we were able to uh, deliver SSG, um, that antimonial compounds and paromomycin, PM I call it for 17 days as a combination treatment for VL. And also we've been able to deliver as a platform plus other partners, um, uh, liposomal amphotericin B, uh, which is ambisome, uh, together with a multifocin combination uh, for the treatment of VL and HIV co-infection. So if we move to HART, uh, HART uh, is on the other hand, was founded in 2005 in Kinshasa, uh, DRC, uh, with over 120 members, um, in the platform from about 20 institutions. And just like the LEAP platform, the, the, the narrative was the same, was to innovate and to strengthen capacity and so on. So um, to cut a long story short, the HART platform also um, had two, two uh, innovations that were delivered. The Nifotrimox eflonithin uh, combination therapy, that's NECT, uh, which is also included in the WHO list of essential medicines for treatment of stage two, uh, Africa, African sleeping sickness. And in um, 2018, um, zone, which is an oral treatment, uh, was also uh, uh, innovated and delivered um, and is registered in the DRC for the treatment of the sleeping sickness. Other studies uh, for specialized groups are currently ongoing with fexenidazole. So that briefly is about the two platforms and briefly what we are doing. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, Dr. Wasuna, for that. It's exciting to see what DNDI is doing. And uh, with, then I like, with that, I'd like to move to, to you, Matthew. Um, you are at H3D, you do cutting edge drug development. We've heard of some of the things that your institution is doing, but can you share with us some of um, the experience that you and your institution have in collaborative drug discovery in Africa, which I think is a really e exciting field given um, the, the many infectious diseases for which we still, we still need uh, drugs, including drugs for the last mile and improvement of existing ones and, and, and so on. So just share with us some of what you're doing, Matthew. Uh, thank you, Dr. Muasi, and uh, thank you to the participants for attending this meeting. So I will start by mentioning that I'm attending the meeting on behalf of our director, Professor Kelly Chibale, uh, and I'm glad to introduce to you the work that we're doing as the Drug Discovery and Development Center, 
Uh, we are an integrated uh, drug discovery platform founded in 2010 at the University of Cape Town. Uh, and what we mean by an integrated drug discovery platform is that we have the uh, capacity that you'd find at a traditional uh, innovative pharmaceutical industry to prosecute drug discovery projects. So that means we have capacity for medicinal chemistry to both uh, make new molecules or modify existing molecules based on issues that are identified uh, either through preclinical or uh, clinical data. Uh, we have access to a biology platform, uh, specifically in uh, malaria, tuberculosis, and antimicrobial resistance that uh, can look at the uh, biology of the compounds or of the diseases that we try, that we're interested in, and identify issues for optimization, identify uh, mechanisms of action for compounds we're interested in, and really uh, allow us to integrate this information into drug discovery towards a uh, uh, progressing compounds through the sometimes uh, very difficult drug discovery cascade. And finally, at the end of the day, uh, I'm sure a lot of us with uh, maybe a slightly medical background will be aware that uh, however good the compounds are, uh, however efficacious they are, uh, we also need them to uh, circulate in the body for long enough for them to uh, exert the desired effect. And so we also have a good uh, drug metabolism and pharmacokinetics platform, uh, which I had. And really, uh, th this platform allows us to look at how uh, new drug molecules or existing ones in the, clinic, uh, in the clinic are broken down in the body and to come up with solutions and uh, use that information to see how we can optimize their duration of action uh, either at an early stage in preclinical models or uh, later on through uh, prediction techniques to see how we can optimize them for, um, uh, for human dosing. And through this platform, we've been able to, uh, with the support of different partners, uh, progress compounds. Uh, I think our most advanced compound currently is in uh, phase two clinical trials for malaria. And so this is really a good example of how uh, we can build such platforms in Africa and really uh, progress uh, uh, drug discovery to address uh, African, pro African uh, problems. Uh, the other side of this is, of course, that I think as both uh, Dr. Alfred and uh, Dr. Asuna have highlighted that uh, uh, drug discovery by its very nature is a very uh, uh, complex field that requires a lot of collaborations to uh, achieve anything at the end. We are all aware of the uh, various uh, costs that are associated with this process. And so at the end of the day, it's not just about what uh, H3D is doing, it's also about uh, what H3D and others are able to do to build collaborations and to build capacity across Africa uh, so that we're able to get to that uh, critical mass of uh, scientists and critical mass of centers that we need uh, in order to address our continent-wide problems. And so uh, one of our uh, uh, quite unique programs we have uh, in this area is the Grand Challenges Africa program. And really the program was founded in 2018 uh, as a result of discussions with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Medicines for Malaria Venture, the Ventures and the uh, African Academy of Sciences. And the idea behind it was to uh, find uh, and develop uh, African scientists in order to uh, uh, ext uh, expand and strengthen the drug uh, discovery ecosystem in Africa. And the idea is that we uh, identify uh, scientists. Uh, we will usually, uh, we've done one call in 2018 and another one uh, late last year. So we identify scientists uh, and we provide uh, these scientists access to our drug discovery platforms and they essentially get to uh, drive their programs completely at their home institutions and we jointly work with them to identify challenges uh, and see how we are able to progress those programs at their level while uh, building uh, their capacity, while building capacity at local level. Uh, and so uh, the first cohort of uh, eight researchers, I think, is uh, just about to finish their work. And uh, we hope uh, quite soon to be able to identify the next uh, cohort of uh, eight scientists that will be uh, progressing to our program. And so uh, together with this, of course, we are also involved. I think I see a few familiar names uh, among the uh, attendees. Uh, we are also involved in uh, joint uh, applications to uh, funding bodies uh, trying to, pro to promote 
uh, African-led collaborations uh, when we need to do uh, applications, uh, especially the bigger applications, for example, with the uh, NIH and with the uh, European Union. So uh, I think that's just a, a small snippet of uh, the type of work that we're involved in, and I hope that we can continue getting involved in as we uh, continue expanding the drug discovery ecosystem in Africa. Thank you, John. No, oh, thanks, uh, Matthew. I think what's very exciting is how your work really provides an opportunity for um, young African scientists from across the continent, not only in South Africa, and, and particularly how you engage in joint applications with other bodies and entities. I think it's the true spirit of collaboration, um, which really um, is the spark for, uh, for innovation. Thank you very much. And I'd like to turn to you, uh, Dr. Burihanga uh, from AU uh, NEPAD. And uh, as we, 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 we know a lot of what uh, AU NEPAD does, but we'd like to know uh, specifically the support that um, you've been providing um, to bolster the African innovation ecosystem. Uh, you know, NEPAD is a, it's a major convener. And of course, um, in-house from within Africa, funding and support is so critical. We'd really like to know uh, some of what you do uh, so that so the scientists listening can also appreciate and take advantage of, of the opportunities which uh, you provide. Janet. Thank you so much, John, and thanks for the participants that have made it to attend this session. I do hope that uh, you get to learn a thing or two regarding uh, how we intend to strengthen the ecosystem for health research and innovation in Africa. And particularly this discussion, I just want to um, mention that uh, within the African Union's Agenda 2063, uh, the Africa that we want, um, the AU has um, an aspiration for African people to have a high standard of living, quality of life, sound health and well being, and an assured health security. So, in 2016, uh, the African Union um, uh, member states, particularly the ministers of health, adopted um, what they call the Africa Health Strategy that uh, runs from the period of 2016 to 2030. And that's in line with the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And this strategy recognized the importance of investing in research and innovation for tackling health challenges on the continent. And uh, the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD, was mandated by the Specialized Technical Committee on Health, Population and Drug Control, which is the decision-making body on, on, on matters related with health, population and nutrition within the African Union. Uh, to, co to collaborate with interested partners and facilitate the integration of health research and innovation within the Africa Health Strategy that was adopted at the time. In order to achieve this, the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD, had to conduct a situation analysis and review uh, with the aim of reviewing what was happening on the continent in terms of um, health research and innovation ecosystem. And we did identify through analyzing the data that we collected, we did identify gaps uh, within the ecosystem. And I just want to mention the seven key gaps that were identified with, uh, uh, in the ecosystem. Number one was the limited sustainable financing mechanisms for health research and innovation in Africa. And number two was participate, limited participation of private sector in most of the research projects in Africa. Uh, I, I, gap number three was the fact that the scale up of products emerging from the research and innovation by African institutions was uh, lacking. And uh, we, uh, we also noted that uh, there was limited knowledge management and innovation dissemination systems uh, to elevate the knowledge outputs of African research. Gap number five was the lack of adaptive and proportionate regulatory systems and intellectual property rights systems 
uh, that could uh, that need to support rather than stay for research and innovation. Gap number six was the limited South-South collaboration and coordination and, and, and other colleagues have talked about collaborative uh, health research and innovation uh, amongst scientists. So we did uh, notice that there was limited South-South collaboration and coordination between scientists and, and funding agencies. And then finally, um, uh, gap number seven was the fact that there was uh, a poor African representation in international research and funding fora where health innovation research agenda setting and decisions on resource allocations are made. So our technical advisory support therefore um, aims to address uh, these key challenges as I've mentioned. And we definitely know that we cannot do it alone. Uh, simply uh, we try and contribute through what our mandate and comparative advantage as an AU body uh, allows us to do. And so we deliver and package our solutions through uh, member states and regional economic communities and in partnership with the relevant um, uh, stakeholders, particularly our solutions focus on agenda setting and priority setting, um, designing and reviewing and reforming institutions that are dealing with health research and innovation. And we do that uh, via the, the, the policies and the regulation and legislation that we try to draft together with these uh, member states and regional economic communities. The other part of our uh, technical advisory solutions are packaged to, uh, to mobilize uh, uh, resources. And as a broker, we leverage the partner's financial and technical support to implement both the national and regional health research and innovation strategies that um, they would have adopted. We do foster system, systematic collaboration and networking among re relevant players within the innovation ecosystem to enable knowledge transfer. We also ensure that uh, there is effectiveness and efficiency uh, in, in the partnerships that we establish uh, in order to support the various in initiatives that uh, are, 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 are present on the continent. And how do we do this? We ensure that the partners that, we, that, that, that are working with us align their support to the set out regional priorities. And also we ensure that there is partner coordination through the various engagements that we have with the, with the, with the partners and the partners platforms that we have established. And then uh, we make sure that there is um, definition of the collective impact and sharing of partners' roles and responsibility so that there is minimum uh, duplication of effort. We do, uh, like um, Mr. Chair, you've mentioned, convene um, different platforms, um, uh, particularly those that involve policymakers and, and, and private sector and, and civil society and different other players and ensure that uh, they give their contribution to the ecosystem. And we are able to understand their comparative advantage and we are able to also tap and into their knowledge and, 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 and best leverage uh, on what they're able to, to deliver. So that is our mode of op op operation. And we do hope that um, uh, definitely, we are not a panacea to the solutions, uh, the challenges related to, 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 to health research and innovation. We believe that with everybody around this uh, uh, conference and uh, other partners interested in Africa's health research and innovation, we will be able to achieve the desired goal for a robust um, uh, health research and innovation ecosystem in Africa. Thank you again, Chair. Well, thank you very much uh, for that, Janet. Again, very excited to see all that um, AU NEPAD is doing. I'll come back to you again uh, to understand better how you you try to help, especially around the regulatory issues. So, I'll be coming back to you very soon on that. I'd like to to get to go to you, Dr. Urabe, from uh, the, the Git Fund. Um, well, as we all know, Git is not a is not a bank per se, but they really a major funder of collaborative research um, in Africa 
particularly for infectious diseases and NTDs for that matter. We'd like to understand um, from you, uh, Dr. Rabe, uh, first of all, how you managed to pull together all this funding and the mechanisms through which you push that out to actors across the globe, particularly in Africa, to conduct the much needed research into drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics. Dr. Rabe. Great, thank you, Chair. Uh, let me share a screen just very quickly, very quick. Uh, sometimes the visuals um, help um, a thousand words. So JHIT Fund, we, we, we are a fund, we, we have been around since 2013. It all started with uh, um, our previous CEO, um, um, when he was discussing with multiple stakeholders over a bowl of soba, or maybe in, in African context, it's maybe with ugali or posho, I guess, maybe that's the uh, local um, term. Um, but it, it started off with, if there's any way for us to uh, work together with different stakeholders, the government, the foundations, and the pharmaceutical companies to amass all the intellect together and funding together to invest in diseases, uh, malaria, TB, and NTDs, and different interventions, therapeutics, diagnostics, vaccines, to do product development. When we say uh, invest, but it's essentially grants that we give out, trying to move uh, products from discovery stage all the way to registration. And we don't only work on discovery to registration, that's, that's where we invest money, uh, for, um, but we do facilitate the access and delivery portion. As it was mentioned earlier, the end-to-end -end approach is also very important here. It, discovery, if you only work on discovery without really consent, cons, um, considering the access and delivery piece, it's not really going to really help those people who are in need. And also there was uh, another comment uh, with regards to knowing getting the TPP early. I think it was uh, Dr. Wasuna's um, point, uh, start well in advance, the R&D. We, we do that uh, by looking at uh, research and development. Uh, so we do require the developers to work on the TPP well in advance uh, to work uh, towards the product. And as I said, we are a public and private partnership. So we do work with uh, a public sector, uh, namely the Jap government of Japan and UNDP. We do have a lot of connection uh, uh, there in the public sector and the private sector, which are mainly uh, pharmaceutical companies, both Japanese and global, and then the rest 25% contributed by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Welcome Trust. So it's an amalgamation of three different parties working together to uh, help these product development. And in terms of how we operate and how we work together with um, African um, entities, uh, just to give you a figure, we have invested uh, so far 260 million as of uh, June 2021, since our inception in 2013, um, half of which is in the NTD space, around half of that is in NTD space. And you can see here, we have about 13 investments uh, with the, uh, African partners and these numbers, 5, 2, 14, 20s, are all collaboration with the African um, entities. So we do work very closely. And this, these are only numbers for direct uh, collaboration. So if you were to consider, um, let's say, clinical trial sites or some work beyond, let's say, UNDP's um, access and delivery partnership, it's, going, it's, it's much, much more. We do work very closely with um, Africa. And what I wanted to emphasize here is that, yes, uh, uh, all our programs require collaboration between Japan and, and overseas entities. And uh, Japan, um, we're good at different technologies, but if you don't put them in a local context, you'll, you'll never get them the right way. So it would be really good for us to foster increasing collaboration to work with um, those um, entities, institutions, research institutions, universities, et cetera, on the ground to work with our uh, technologists in, in Japan and also work with technologists in, in Africa as well, who knows the real needs and then work together to really make it into the product um, together, working um, collaboratively. Um, so with that, thank you, Chair, I'll pass, pass back to you. No, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rabe, uh, for that. It, it is uh, great to see the, the millions that have been so judiciously pushed out and have actually provided us with good results. Because of time, I'll, I'd like to go on um, again, uh, this time back to you again, uh, Dr. Biruhanga. Um, as I mentioned to you, uh, the work you do is so critical because 
you do also address issues of ethics and regulation and harmonization of these, the different regu regulations that exist across countries on the continent sometimes become burdensome and a hindrance to research. Issues around IP, and we've all heard some of the horror stories around IP either being taken away without proper acknowledgement or becoming a hindrance or a blockade um, uh, to being able to innovate even though the tools uh, exist. So can you tell us some of what um, uh, you've been doing um, at AU NEPA to, to support in this area? Thank you again, Chair. So again, as our modus operandi demands, we employ a regional or continental approach in our efforts to support members, member states. And we have continued to engage the national regulatory authorities to um, ensure that they, they strengthen the, 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 the regulatory systems uh, for medical products. And um, through the African Medicines Regulatory Harmonization um, Initiatives, we have drafted and had the member states um, through their regional economic communities where they belong um, adopt harmonized guidelines. And uh, these harmonized guidelines are used by the individual countries uh, within the regional block. And um, the, the objective here is to ultimately have um, the countries be able to um, mutually recognize uh, the, the various standards that uh, have been adopted uh, to regulate the, these um, uh, medical products. We do establish um, uh, platforms uh, that enable um, transfer of knowledge. And um, the, I can mention the, the 11 uh, regional centers of regulatory excellence that have been established that assist the regulators to pool capacity and, and, and to uh, deploy training and capacity building across the various um, uh, regulatory activities that um, are undertaken uh, would have otherwise been difficult for a, an individual national regulatory authority to undertake. So these regional centers of excellence do help um, out in terms of um, pooling the, 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 the capacity, pooling the knowledge and, and then disseminating this knowledge. On, on regulatory science uh, to, to, to the regulators. Um, regarding ethics, uh, we continue to urge the researchers to be responsible and, and, and conduct responsible research and encourage member states to enact legislation that's aligned with internationally agreed codes of ethics, especially um, um, those that definitely protect our people from abuse and, 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 and um, the research that is being done, uh, we ensure that it's aligned with the, with the international regulations. Regarding the IP uh, issue, we do um, continue to connect and encourage member states uh, uh, to approach our continental and regional institutions that have been um, established to, that have the capacity to train, have the capacity to, um, to, to, to provide resources in terms of um, improving the in intellectual property system. And I can mention some of these regional hubs being um, um, the Africa Regional Intellectual Property Organization, ARIPO, and OWAPI for the uh, 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 countries where we they have the competences to support the member states and so we continue to engage these organizations we have developed some instruments together with regional economic communities that focus on specific areas of intellectual property uh, and, and and they appreciate the the, the fact that um uh, they're beginning now to register more and more um, um uh, intellectual property using their national offices and and uh, we do believe that the more we engage and, 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 and utilize and leverage the, the competencies of these regional offices uh, for intellectual property, including the WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, we will be able to uh, um, uh, strengthen the IP and uh, begin to 
benefit uh, from, from intellectual property going forward. And um, for now, I will stop there and thank you again, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for that, um, Dr. Bihanga, appreciate it. Um, Dr. Rabe, just back to you again. Um, you, you told us about the kind of funding that uh, the Git Fund provides and the mechanisms through which you do this, but I also understand that you, you don't do this alone. You often collaborate with other funders to promote innovation. Can you, can you help us understand how this works in a way that is able to really make the most out of potential synergies uh, and, and contribute to measurable impact? Um, thank you, Chair. So uh, we call ourselves GHIT. It's, it's very hard to see it from GHIT, but uh, that's how we call it. And uh, thank you very much, sorry for not being clear. But uh, so uh, from GHIT, we consider medicines are vitalized without access. So I think for us, the continuum because uh, from the R&D all the way up to access and delivery, we have to consider um, both uh, as end-to-end -end approach, as I mentioned in earlier. And on the R&D side, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, we do fund uh, research partnerships that are specifically created uh, to deliver specific work or um, maybe more established, uh, work with more established PDPs, like of course DNDI or TB Alliance or MMV, um, et cetera. But for, uh, as I said, for specific work, like for the case we have with uh, a pediatric formulation work uh, for um, um, schistosomiasis. Uh, and that, we, that one we work with uh, uh, places like Kemri or University of Poignier from um, Ivory Coast, et cetera. So for R&D side, uh, we do have these different uh, partnerships where we can actually get uh, different um, funding from different sources. And as for programs that are closer um, to the market, we actually do require grantees to find co-funders um, so that we can work together with other funders because we are um, uh, a relatively small fund uh, by ourselves, but we would like to be a catalytic funder to actually pull different funding, let's say from other foundations, um, like Gates Foundations, or for instance, the um, for the schistosomiasis program, we did have um, a program co-funded by uh, some something like EDCTP. Um, and also for the programs that are closer um, to the market, uh, we do have uh, what we call a top-down approach where we do look at the landscape of um, funders and uh, we try to bring all the innovators and funders and uh, access stakeholders together under this platform called Uniting Efforts for Innovation, Access and Delivery, which we started uh, in collaboration with uh, UNDP and the government of Japan uh, in 20. 19. So that's a, a top-down approach. And of course, the bottom-up approach is more to do with working directly with the groups that are uh, the grantees and trying to find out ways to connect and accelerate the program development by uh, either us uh, getting into different conversations to, uh, to stimulate and facilitate the conversation going forward and, um, or um, basically connecting them with the right um, stakeholders. So I think it is... Uh, the importance of coordination with other funders is um, incredibly important. And you know, we, we always tell our grantees to try to use us to try to connect with different stakeholders so that we could be a um, catalytic uh, funder uh, in order to bring in more uh, funding in order to accelerate the program to help reach the patients um, very quickly. So yes, uh, those are the um, points that we're trying to work with, but basically uh, getting the uh, funding stakeholders all come together on one table and then work together to find um, solutions together. Thank you, Chair. I think, I think it's uh, critical uh, knowing that there is not additive but syn synergy or synergistic power when uh, major funders like um, GHIT and, and others come together and we do see the results. We're hoping to see more of this and, and really take full advantage of these synergies. Uh, Dr. Wasuna, I'd like to come to you um, based on some of the information that uh, funders and conveners um, like um, uh, GHIT as a funder and uh, AU NEPAD as a convener um, have given us, a, what, what are some of the, the outputs, the, the, the real stuff, uh, the successes that we have had based on some of the support that 
DNDI has been able to receive or also has been able to provide to others. But of course, not only the successes, but some of the challenges that have been faced along that pathway. Perhaps you could use uh, the LEAP and the HAT platforms as you know, classic examples of these. Uh, thank you very much, uh, John. Um, so, as I, I, I'm using the LEAP and the HAT platform uh, to really talk about the successes and, and, and the challenges of uh, these uh, the workings of the disease specific platforms uh, in, in Africa. So, actually, you're asking me to, um, to take you through the journey, uh, the 17, 16 year journey of the platforms. And that is really uh, a lot. And, and this, we really have had a lot of success uh, in the two platforms. But I just want to mention that we were able to achieve so much. Um, although we started uh, in, in of, of inequity where we were lacking capacity, where the infrastructure for research was fragmented, where there was no funding, uh, you know, uh, and where there are no treatments. So we wanted to innovate, but we were limited. So that's the, where we started and now where we are now. So for the platforms to have achieved so much to the extent of innovating at least two uh, treatments each uh, for the conditions, I think that was really commendable. And we could do that because of the partnerships that we, we developed. And right from the beginning, we involved our governments, we involved uh, ministries of health, we worked with the national disease control programs, we worked with the regulatory authorities, then you know, there was regulatory uh, uh, authorities, there was, uh, wasn't so much expertise in other countries where we're working, but at least now that has improved, but then, you know, so we worked with the World Health Organization, with research institutions, academia, with MSF, civil society, clinicians, everyone, and the communities. So that alone was an achievement of getting all those people together and the platforms to innovate. Because when you're innovating, you need everyone. And so we were, we were able to consolidate uh, and strengthen research, existing research uh, and development capacities, and also started even to get involved in access to treatments because there's it's not, it's not useful to innovate and the patients don't get the treatment. What are we doing? So we are also starting to involve ourselves in, in access. So this was a forum also to be able to promote scientific uh, exchange and sharing of knowledge. So in fact, we, we brought uh, scientists from say, for example, within the LIP platform, scientists from Sudan who are well versed with clinical trials came all the way to Amudat uh, and took the, the doctors there and the, 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 the researchers through what it means to do a clinical trial, what must you do, and, and training. And you know, when you, you, you mentor the young scientists, that was really um, uh, a very good plus for the platforms because you, 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 you looked up to a professor who, who taught you, you know, firsthand. And when you go to read the books, you find that it's an author of some of those books. So, this was really a very powerful uh, way of capacity building. Uh, and so we were also able to foster South-South collaboration, you know, uh, different countries collaborating. And that was really uh, a very good uh, example of success in the platforms. And we were therefore able to uh, strengthen research capacities in countries. And uh, we were able to ensure, ensure that clinical trials were led and driven by African scientists. Uh, in the endemic countries. So this also gave uh, uh, oomph to the young, younger scientists. You know, I want to be like Monique, I want to be like uh, Dr. John, I want to be. So that, that, that really was a success. But, um, and we did a lot of training as well. Uh, we trained a lot of uh, young scientists uh, in terms of specific uh, clinical trials, uh, clinical trial specific trainings, but also a master's and the PhDs and um, the lots of trainings that were done. But going back to innovation, and, and I think this is really a pride. I, 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 I am proud of the innovations that were made uh, in the platforms. Uh, so uh, I said before, for, for the LIP platform, we're able to innovate. 
we were able to combine the two treatments, the SSG and paramomycin, I, I defined to you what they were, for the treatment of VL in Eastern Africa. And a big trial of over a thousand patients in the four countries, six sites, and some sites never been done clinical trials before. And you know, when you're doing a clinical trial, these are highly regulated uh, studies, both nationally and internationally. So everybody must be on their toes. So we were able to really carry out meticulous research and delivered uh, the combination treatment for 17 days um, and, and compared to the SSG alone for 30 days, which was the only treatment then for, for, for VL in the region. And, and, and WHO looked at the data and they were able to recommend our innovation uh, as fast-line treatment uh, for VL uh, in the Eastern Africa. So that was really a big, big um, yeah, success for us. And this has been adopted into a policy change has been made, the revision of guidelines for VL treatment in those countries have been done and this treatment has been adopted. And also it's in the um, um, essential medicine list for this country. So that's a big plus. And I also had mentioned the HIV uh, VL combination I mean, uh, co-infection, which we also have innovated uh, together with the partners in everything we do in DNDI. So even if I don't say partners, just know that there are partners in there. We never ever work alone. So we innovated with partners um, and there are many and I can't list all of them. Um, and we're able to deliver a treatment that is ambisome, liposome and phototericin B and miltifosin, which is an oral compound for the treatment of uh, VL. Um, and for the heart platform, uh, it's the same, same thing. That's, uh, you know, capacity building and training and infrastructure upgrade, all those apply also to the heart platform. So I'll not repeat them, but we were able to innovate. In the next, as I said before, and in the fexinidazole. Fexinidazole is a new chemical entity, a new drug altogether. We started from scratch and we were able to uh, treat patients with uh, sleeping sickness and able to show that a 10 day treatment was enough to cure them. And what a game changer because the, the cases just had a, a significant drop. And now uh, the sleeping sickness is in the last mile. And even then we're innovating, we're trying to find a magic bullet, one drug that will, you know, uh, completely um, uh, cure the, the the sleeping sickness. So that's where we are, and the studies are still ongoing uh, using feximetazole in specialized groups, but those are the innovations. So maybe briefly, John, just three, two minutes, uh, I talk about the challenges. Challenges were many, especially where we started from. We started from far, far, far in some of the countries. And uh, because the, the uh, research infrastructure was poor and you know the, nobody had done some clinical trials even the infrastructure just even in the settings we were started in some countries where we started the studies in the tents and then um, you know uh, DMDI uh, with the help of the donors was able to put up uh, some you know treatment centers for these patients and and so we started far um, so those were the problems we had different regulatory and uh, uh, systems in place. And I'm glad that my sister Janet is talking about uh, regulatory harmonization. That's really the dream of any researcher. When we have ethics and regulatory harmonization, that's the dream because you cut your time even more than half uh, waiting for approvals. So this was really a problem and cultural environments, we, we have to be sensitive to other people's cultures and respect them. We are working from different countries. So that, that that's where problems. Uh, and we work in the middle of nowhere. So we also had staff limitations, people leaving high staff turnover in some of the areas and countries. So those are the problems. Um, and of course the climate and the terrain did not <laughs> leave, <laughs> we did not stay out of our path. We work in the middle of nowhere. And so the climate, you know, when it rains, the roads are, you know, washed away. And you're just lucky when you go from point A to point B because you could just, just go down the cliff. And so sometimes this uh, made a recruitment of uh, patients very slow. So that really, those are the challenges. And thank you very much, John. I've, I've, I've skimmed through, but could be more. Yeah, thank you. 
Now, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wasuna. I can tell there's a lot more that you'd have loved to share with us. And I mean, how, how easy is it to box in perhaps over a decade um, of, of work into just a couple of minutes, but much appreciated. Um, I, I want to move on to you, um, Dr. Njoroge. Um, if you can also speak to some of these challenges, but this time specifically in the drug discovery. So Dr. Wasuna has walked us through a classic example by the hack and the lead platforms of how when we have these new innovative drugs or combinations, we can really test them. But you are at the, in the space where you're actually trying to find these new molecules, looking for new targets and hits, you're doing your high throughput screening and you know, isolating compounds and this kind of thing. Can you tell us some of these challenges that, that you face um, at, at your end or your view of these challenges across the continent of Africa? Matthew? Sure, uh, thanks again, uh, uh, Dr. Mwasi. And I think the other panelists have already done uh, quite a good job at uh, starting to introduce uh, some of the issues that we also face. Uh, I, I think as both uh, uh, Dr. Janet and Dr. Asuna have highlighted, uh, regulatory harmonization, I think, continues to be a challenge that all of us uh, face from time to time. And I'm quite happy to hear that there is a, a lot happening there. But maybe to, to think more about the, the practical day-to-day uh, -day life of a research laboratory, uh, one of the very big things that we face as a challenge is in the recruiting and retaining of drug discovery scientists in Africa. Uh, I think uh, there are some estimates that say that close to about, uh, if not more, of our skilled professionals, that is, Africa's skilled professionals are uh, not working on the continent. And there are many different reasons for this. There are uh, no uh, simple answers or simple solutions. But uh, what it means is that uh, however good our programs are or however innovative we want to be, uh, there is a bit of a limit because we have to uh, either convince people to come back or else we have to uh, make a decision, a conscious decision to recruit the best talent, whatever we can find it. And that's uh, uh, quite a big challenge and of course has a lot of implications in being able to uh, address and met uh, medical needs in Africa. Because at the end of the day, I think as all of us will acknowledge, the best way to do this will be to find uh, skilled African professionals to uh, work on addressing these challenges. Uh, of course, uh, the, the question of uh, brain drag, if, you, if we could summarize it that way, has, as we've said, uh, multiple causes and noisy solutions. But I think one of the biggest uh, contributors to this is uh, uh, the problem of infrastructure. And of course, when we think about infrastructure, sometimes we uh, restrict ourselves to thinking about the buildings and the equipment. And all that is good, and I think, uh, 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 Africa has started making uh, quite big advances in this. I think I can think of uh, a number of uh, uh, research labs in Africa that would be able to uh, compete uh, at the cutting edge uh, of world-class research uh, in terms of the biomedical research that they're able to do. Uh, I can think specifically in areas of uh, uh, genetics, for example, or uh, cell biology, where uh, I think we've made uh, quite big strides uh, in the last decade. But the other side of inf infrastructure is thinking also about the uh, ecosystem of drug discovery, which is specifically, for example, uh, when we think about uh, how long it takes us to order in chemicals or the regulatory challenges that we might find. I think we've had challenges, for example, with our colleagues as we try to build collaborations across Africa. And we find that if they need to order a simple chemical, that they are not able to do that because the uh, regulatory regime is such that they need multiple permits to order something that uh, for, a, for someone in another lab in Europe would just be a click of a button and uh, receiving it. But even for us in South Africa who are uh, lucky perhaps to uh, have a slightly more pers permissive uh, regulatory regime that allows us to get in uh, a lot of the consumables that we need for research, there's also the question of uh, the, the turnaround times. Uh, and uh, all of us, I think, will appreciate that uh, cutting edge science requires cutting edge results. You need to be able to uh, think of the hypothesis you want to test and when the ideas are still fresh, be able to prosecute them to their uh, logical end. And uh, I think for a lot of us in Africa, that is uh, not always a possibility 
Um, I'm waiting, for example, for chemicals that I ordered around uh, two months ago, and they're still somewhere lost in shipping or in, stuck in customs or uh, something else. And what that means is that even when we have uh, very good ideas and very good projects, uh, there are delays. Um, there, there are delays that are intrinsic to that that uh, maybe we're not able to overcome. And here again, uh, there are noisy solutions, but it's something that uh, will require uh, essentially a critical mass of research centers. Because if you think about this from the uh, other point of view, which is from the commercial provider's point of view, uh, it doesn't make sense for them, for example, to have uh, warehouses in Africa full of a certain chemical if uh, only one lab in Africa is going to be ordering that. However, if there are more of us engaged in research, more of us prosecuting drug discovery types uh, of uh, research and other things, then it becomes more commercially feasible for them to be able to stock some of these things and be able to reduce the turnaround times that we experience. Uh, there are, of course, quite a, a number of other challenges that we could uh, point to, but uh, one of the others uh, that I'd like to point to, just because it's something maybe that uh, won't be covered by any of the other panelists, is that we also have an innate challenge in Africa, uh, and this is the genetic diversity of our population. And from a drug discovery perspective, this becomes uh, very important. Uh, I think uh, by some estimates, I think we are the, amongst the most diverse uh, populations in the world. And as we might know, uh, the genetic diversity will have influences on how uh, we respond to drugs, and it will also have an impact on uh, how those drugs are uh, processed in the body and how long they stay in the body. I think there are already some uh, good uh, summaries in literature, uh, especially in the area of uh, TB and HIV, uh, where there are a number of drugs that whose uh, toxicity uh, is slightly higher in the African population just because of the uh, diversity for drug metabolizing enzymes, which means that for certain drugs, the same doses that have been optimized in other populations uh, will lead to much higher levels uh, of the drug uh, in, Af in the African population, which will mean uh, that there is greater propensity for toxicity and all that. And of course, the same is true uh, at a disease biology level that uh, a number of the receptors, if I think, for example, of uh, uh, some of the things involved in cancer treatment or involved in, uh, 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 in hypertension treatment, but a number of those receptors are uh, quite specific to the uh, specific um, uh, genetic diversity that we have. And that means that uh, some of the treatments that are optimized elsewhere may, uh, may not always work for us. And really here, I, I think the solution, uh, and, I'm sure, and I think there are quite a number of people already uh, thinking about this, is finding ways to uh, build in more clinical trials in Africa so that we are able to uh, test these treatments within our populations and then uh, find the right drugs and the right doses to uh, address our diseases. Uh, there are, of course, many other things I think that we could point to, but I think uh, that's a good summary of uh, the main challenges that we uh, have to think about. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much for that, Matthew. I think one thing that struck me, uh, which you mentioned, which I also experienced, is just the challenge in ordering, um, you know, key, key components, implement even reagents, that are needed for some of our work. And even sometimes the quality of uh, these, um, these reagents and some of these things, uh, it, it's, it's quite problematic and I can really identify with that. So uh, we're hoping that a lot of these can be addressed as we try to ramp up infrastructure across the, the continent. But I'd like to move on and I'm very conscious of time. I want to encourage you all, please, if you have questions or contributions, please make use of the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I encourage you to start fielding your questions so that we can line them up and, and address them. Um, we'll have to eat a bit into the Q&A time, uh, but I'd like to go um, back to you, um, Dr. Urabe, um, to, to ask you very specifically with GHIT, um, how you think you can promote African-led innovation and initiatives uh, specifically around um, MTDs. You, you have told us about the broad work that you do, but what specifically can JHIT do or is planning to do uh, with regard to MTDs um, and innovation in Africa? Just very briefly in the next uh, maybe three or so minutes, if you would. Thank you. 
Okay, I'll try to make it into two so that, so that we have more time. Um, so in terms of Jihit's contribution, um, as I said, uh, I guess we, we're here to make, uh, to form innovative uh, partnerships. So if it's collaboration between Japan and Africa, I think that's, that's something that we could definitely foster. We would like to uh, also promote need-based research, you know, considering the TPP, TPP and having this end-to-end -end considerations from the beginning. And that's something uh, that's only possible uh, in collaboration with the local context. You know, uh, um, the African-led innovation has to work with the, let's see, the Japanese technology providers who may need a little bit more guidance from their technology standpoint to fit into the local context. So working in the need-based uh, approach from um, Africa end, uh, that, that's one way that for us to form the partnership. And also in terms of, uh, in addition to forming technological partnership, I think what we can contribute is more to do with um, catalytic funding, as we said, you know, as we are um, connected uh, from different types of funders, different types of pharmaceutical and different types of international organizations, trying to use us to leverage um, more funding um, um, to be channeled into these um, efforts so that the African-led innovations would be uh, sufficiently funded to progress on their researches that are, are, are taking place. And also just last point, I think uh, with regards to the local sense, uh, if there are uh, ways for, um, you know, uh, for technology providers in Japan to access some of the samples from the local, and that could be something that uh, really could accelerate the programs going forward because it's sample um, access is some you know very difficult uh, um, from um, perspective from from the technology providers in Japan. So so combination of yeah, technology and uh, funding and uh, maybe on the side note the, the sample access. I think those are something that we could work together with. Well thank you very much for that uh, Dr. Dr. Ravi as, as you can tell I mean, this this is a very direct question at you because we we always interested in you know specifically what GHIT will be able to do to ramp up, and I know um, uh, GHIT has has very good plans for promoting African led innovation, and we're really looking forward to some of these. Um, Dr. Angeloji, I want to come back to you again uh, regarding how you see uh, the future of drug discovery in in Africa. Um, there's still many neglect tropical diseases, infectious diseases to be addressed across the continent. Uh, there's now COVID and still several other issues which require drug discovery. Even if you want to move away from infectious disease into non-communicable diseases, so many issues, but the, the landscape is still very nascent. How, how do you see the future? Um, and uh, what are some of the um, structures or systems or actions that have been put in place to help African researchers and institutions to lead this work. As Dr. Wasuna rightly mentioned, uh, that really um, it, it is important that those who are facing the problem are involved and at the forefront actually of, of, of finding the solutions. Dr. Njerodi. Thank you very much, Dr. Wasi. And I'll start by just reflecting on the fact that uh, the fact that we are able to have uh, a panel on African uh, biomedical innovation at the World Health Symposium and attract people such as uh, Dr. Wasuna and Dr. Janet and myself from H3D means that we already have quite a lot of this, uh, quite a lot of uh, the big African-led efforts uh, that are already happening uh, right now on the ground. And that's a big step that maybe 10 years ago uh, would not have been possible to, to envision. And so uh, in a way, uh, one might almost say that the future is here. That is, we already have uh, a number of, quite a number of these organizations and uh, uh, universities and other, uh, uh, and other private sector uh, led efforts uh, that are already uh, trying to uh, address issues in drug discovery and uh, biomedical innovation. And I think in reflecting about the future, I would say that uh, we have quite a bright future in drug discovery in Africa. Uh, sometimes uh, being uh, the fact that we are just starting off on the journey could be a disadvantage, but uh, it's also an advantage because it shows the uh, capacity that we have for uh, growth in this area and really uh, the number of opportunities that are just uh, waiting for the right person or the right project or the right resources 
uh, in order that we're able to prosecute them successfully. Uh, and then in thinking about uh, how we meet this challenge uh, of the future and uh, make sure that we uh, continue leading biomedical innovation, uh, I think one of the things we need to think about is uh, how to foster a better collaboration between African institutions. I think there is a lot of room, uh, and maybe this also needs a lot of reflection on uh, whether we want to have efforts in parallel or where uh, it's better and uh, helps us to build up a, a, a bigger critical mass by combining some efforts. And so it's something that requires reflection, especially because uh, a lot of times uh, when there are opportunities with uh, 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 North for North-South collaboration, for example, uh, it makes uh, more sense to have an African-led collaboration, for example, competing for this and able to uh, offer solutions uh, right from the uh, biomedical level of, say, cellular biology and going all the way into clinical trials and marketing and all that. And I think if we are able to uh, build these collaborations and find the proper projects to compete for them, uh, I think we are potentially able to uh, move drug discovery uh, quite a bit. Uh, the issue of regulatory harmonization, I think, has already come up. And from a drug right. discovery uh, scientist perspective, uh, I think uh, uh, the, the main thing to think about is, I think, as the other panelists have brought up, the fact that we want to be able to, uh, once we come up with these innovations, to uh, develop them under similar regulatory frameworks, uh, because again, that is uh, could be one of the potential uh, bottlenecks uh, in the process. And then uh, right at the be beginning, uh, Dr. Janet mentioned the uh, limited involvement of the private sector in Africa uh, in contributing to research. And this is uh, partly on the private sector side, uh, perhaps uh, partly on the government side and partly on society side, but we need we all need to find ways of being uh, more engaged in uh, supporting research that uh, addresses and met medical needs. And I think if all of us, if we think about, for example, the innovation industries in the global world, I think there are quite a number of examples of the private sector being uh, actively involved in uh, solving issues that uh, affect yeah. those populations. And I think we need our private sector to uh, start uh, contributing to that as well. Thank you. Sure. Thank, thank you very much for that, Matthew. I'm, I'm cognizant of time. I was actually enjoying it so much that I almost lost track. Um, but um, Veronica Mwamba, I see you have your hand up. Um, unfortunately, we cannot allow you to speak. Well, not that we can allow you, but the system does not allow you to make oral contributions. So kindly type whatever you have in the q and I would like to crave your indulgence for just some, some seven to 10 minutes more while we wrap up. So do type your questions. I do see there's one in there already. But um, Dr. Janet, um, if you could quickly tell us just something uh, more specific about the African Medicines Agency, AMA. I know you mentioned this quickly. It's so critical in supporting the development of innovative uh, drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics in Africa. And can you let us know what the latest on the status of the, uh, the AMA treaty um, is? Just, just really quickly, and then I'll move to, uh, to pick the question. I'll have uh, Dr. Dr. Wasuna to wrap up for us. Uh, thank you so much, Chair and uh, um, uh, fellow colleagues. So the treaty that establishes the African Medicines Agency was adopted in February 2019 by the Assembly of Heads of State and Government of the African Union. So the Assembly called uh, on the African Union member states to sign and ratify the treaty in order for the treaty to enter into force as soon as possible. The African Medicines Agency will be the second continental health agency after the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that will enhance the capacity of state parties and regional economic communities to regulate medical products on the continent. The African Medicines Agency will also promote the adoption and harmonization of medical products regulatory policies and standards, as well as provide scientific guidelines and coordinate existing regulatory harmonization efforts um, of the African Union. By June 11th, 2021, 12 member states, uh, Benin, Burundi, Cameroon, Chad, Republic of Congo, Gabon, Madagascar, Niger, Saharawi, Arab Democratic Republic, Senegal, Tunisia, and Zimbabwe had signed the treaty. 
three countries only um, have signed and submitted uh, their instruments of ratification, and these are Algeria, Morocco, and Sierra Leone. No, those ones are yet to submit the, 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 the instruments of, 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 of ratification, but seven countries have signed and submitted their instruments of ratification to the commission. And these are Burkina Faso, Ghana, Guinea, Mali, Namibia, Rwanda, and Seychelles. Through the recently appointed African Union Special Envoy on AMA, Mr. Michel Sidibe, advocacy activities continues to continue to be undertaken. And we do hope that many more countries will conclude their ratification process sooner. And if implemented effectively and efficiently, we hope that the African Medicine Agency will play an important role, not only in the regulation of generic medicines, but will contribute to enhancing the capacity and capability of the regulation uh, of new and more complex molecules, including new health technologies. Thank you, Chair. Well, thank you very much uh, for that, um, Janet. Uh, as I said, I'm cognizant of the time, but I just want to pick the two questions I see. Um, they addressed, um, the first one is addressed, well, I'll, I'll just ask in general, I think whoever can pick it up, maybe to you, Janet, and then second one will go to Dr. Wasuna and then she will wrap up. Um, it's about IP rights and suge research suggests that there's little knowledge among innovators to patent their products. Uh, what are some of the deliberate plans to enhance awareness um, among uh, innovators in Africa um, especially the younger researchers regarding IP, as I said before, heard some of the horror stories around IP um, in Africa. So uh, perhaps, Janet, I think this is best uh, suited to you. Maybe, Matthew, you could place just maybe a 30-second comment on that, and then I'll turn to you, Dr. Wasuna, uh, for the, uh, the, the second question we have, as well as your concluding remarks. Thank you so much. Uh, to answer this question, I would like to refer, like, the, if the person who is asking this question is coming from a country that um, has a national um, IP office, most uh, countries in Africa do have these offices. I would like to recommend that they um, approach these offices for uh, further guidance, but we also have tried as much as possible um, for the African uh, English-speaking countries to engage at the regional level with the repo, which is based in, um, in, in Zimbabwe. So uh, there is a lot of capacity there. And if you do uh, engage the um, Africa Regional Intellectual Property Organization there, they would give you a lot of information and uh, um, uh, on how best to uh, patent or to register whatever um, um, IP product you have and to benefit from that. And then for the French speaking countries, OAPI is another organization that is um, available for, 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 to support the African countries on uh, issues related with IP. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Janet. Um, Matthew, do you want to quickly do 30 seconds on that from, from your experience? Sure, uh, and really just to reiterate what Dr. Janet has mentioned, but also to mention that uh, I think in a number of our countries, there there is increasingly uh, institutional uh, IP uh, bodies that help to coordinate between institutions and uh, government bodies. And so, uh, if someone is based in a university, for example, there might be an intellectual property office that helps to uh, coordinate some of these uh, activities between the institution and the uh, national bodies. And so, that is perhaps another avenue to. Uh, learn more about uh, IP protection and uh, institutional perspectives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Much appreciated. And, and to you, Dr. Wasuna, um, what were procedures do you um, uh, put in place in, in order to ensure that uh, the data and other research materials generated are available to other researchers, especially the younger ones starting their career? Of course, we know the usual publications and reports and so on, but are there other avenues through which um, upcoming NTD researchers are able to learn of some of the things that DNDI and, and others are doing in, um, in infectious diseases research, particularly NTDs? And if you could also uh, take the opportunity uh, to tell us a bit of how um, or what can be done to for, for African uh, networks and African countries to play an even more 
um, uh, responsible role in innovation um, at, the, at the global level. Um, thank you, John. So if you allow me, I will start with, um, you know, um, uh, the last question first. Um, so uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, 40% uh, of the NTD burden is borne by Africa. So we in Africa, we, we need to style up and our leaders specifically really need to uh, style up and they need to, um, you know, uh, prioritize innovation and also uh, need um, to, to, you know, to have in their national systems, uh, you know, um, implementation plans and national development plans in place for, for, for NTDs. And I know they're working hard, they've done so much already, but we, you know, it's like a child when you're giving something, you need more. So we need more from African leaders. We really need more uh, so that we can have um, uh, development of new tools, uh, like diagnostic tools and uh, treatments for NTD. You know, when, as I, I repeat it again, we need better tools for testing and uh, treatment. Uh, and uh, we will need, for example, if you take diagnostic, we need a rapid diagnostic test. You just take your sample, you put, you see the color, it's positive, it's negative, then bingo. So that's the sort of thing that we need, simple that can be done in places where we work, which is really um, in the middle of nowhere, where people are suffering in silence. So we need our leaders uh, to, to support this. And we also call on donors to be able to, uh, you know, put money uh, in efforts like this, where, uh, you know, Africans are coming together, working together and, you know, prioritizing the needs of the people. But, you know, we lack uh, funding because they are comp competing interests from our governments. Understandably, they have so many other things to ca take care of. So if our friends be able to come forward and support this, um, I think that uh, we'll be able to achieve the NTD, uh, WHO NTD roadmap 2030. Um, so we also need really to uh, ask our government to foster an, an, an enabling environment for joint initiatives um, that strengthen capacity uh, to be able to innovate and you know being able to engage communities in affected areas of entities. These are usually conflict zones. I mean, if there's conflict, how can that be an enabling environment? So really this call to action to our governments uh, to be able to um, uh, provide that uh, uh, environment uh, for the community so that communities can also participate uh, in, in innovation. Um, also, um, I think sustainability of, of the R&D innovation is, is key and also access, as I mentioned before, we can't innovate and then people have no access. So this is also a call to action that can we, uh, can our governments put money into sustainability of our innovation and uh, can our friends help us. Um, so I think that um, if we cannot protect the past decades gains against NTD, uh, we will not be able to reach the WHO NTD roadmap of 2030. And so we need everyone. We need public leadership. We need cooperation, partnerships. We need everybody to be determined, to be passionate. Uh, and, and we need mentorship. Young people, where are you? You know, we all, we need everyone. So we need everyone to come together uh, for us to succeed. So this is call to action to our governments, to AU. Uh, Janet, you're here. We know we, this is what we are saying on the ground. We need to work together. And we have seen the, in the uh, COVID pandemic, I mean, how Africa has galvanized and come together and, you know, there's direction, there's leadership. Why can't we do this for entities? If we do not, we will suffer the consequence because um, entities will be put aside. So I'm calling all of you to action. So then uh, thank you for that, uh, um, uh, John, uh, because Really, together we will shall go very, very, very far. Answering the question uh, asked about, um, um, let me just get the question again. 
it was uh, how do you, uh, what procedures do you have in place to ensure that data and other research material generated are available? So, okay, when, um, when one does research, um, you know, you either <laughs> publish or perish. So uh, usually uh, what we, as an institution, as DNDI, we've made a concert, it's a policy that all our work is in um, open source journals, they are free, you don't have to pay anything. So all our work, you can reach, our, uh, and you know, the, also the, uh, you can find it in our website, you can, um, but we have also gone a step ahead and uh, involved ourselves with um, data sharing platforms that are existing now. And we're particularly involved with the EDO, which is an infectious uh, uh, disease observatory, infectious disease data observatory um, a platform, which is uh, you know, headed by Oxford University. And we, we have provided our data for leishmaniasis, all the clinical trials, so many of them, 11, uh, I mean, we have reached 11, but maybe we do not provide them all, all of that because we are still analyzing some of the data, but yeah. So we give them the data and you know, the ways whereby students can go in there and, and you know, use that data to even you know, generate more research. So the, the idea is to just share data and, um, and publish where everybody can see your data. And all the clinical trials are registered with the clinical trials uh, observatory. Uh, so you can also get exactly to read how the trial was done and what kind of data was collected. So I hope I've answered the question, but the idea is then to publish in open source and have data sharing platforms, which we are participating. Our data center within DNDI uh, also grew from, uh, I didn't mention it, but it grew from, <laughs> Within the LIP platform uh, was created by DNDI, uh, started uh, you know data management and statistics, and now they are participating in this data sharing platform. And we have now even gone high tech, and have um, um, electronic data capture, and we are doing very well. So we we offer these services. Uh, we can get in touch with us. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Wasuna. Much appreciated. Unfortunately, all good things come to an end, and, and we are really past the time. We really want to appreciate you, the participants, for staying with us, um, uh, even though we've exceeded our time. We had a few technical challenges in the beginning, and so we started late. Uh, so invariably, we, we, we sort of tried to recover the time that we, we lost. I can see there's one more question, but because of time, I'd like to ask uh, Lynette, if you're on the line, if you can just provide your email um, in the chat, in, in the chat, in the Q&A section, if you can respond to that with your email so that um, we can provide the response to that question on cutaneous leishmaniasis directly uh, to the one asking, um, that, that, that would be great, please. So if, if you receive, you see the email address, do just send your question to that email and you will receive a response um, on some updates with cutaneous leishmaniasis. I really wanna thank again um, you, uh, uh, Dr. Urabe from uh, GHIT all the way in Japan, uh, Dr. Birihanga all the way from uh, in South Africa with the AU NEPAD uh, to Dr. Njiroje in, in South Africa as well with drug discovery and development. And also to you, Dr. Wasuna, who's leading the Africa office of the DNDI and the stellar work that you've done over the past close to two decades. I wanna thank so much, Dr. Alfred Mubangizi, Assistant Commissioner for Vector Control Division, MOH, in Uganda for, for coming on, and ultimately to you, uh, the participants. As you can see, the drug discovery innovation um, or biomedical research innovation